Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. Stomachs turn. Tech stocks lead Monday sell-off with chip makers among the worst performers among the escalating trade war with China. Apple looking especially bruised. We'll talk market risk and what investors should do now. Plus, policing the web. Two devastating shootings over the weekend leave dozens dead. President Trump calls for social media companies to detect mass shooters before they strike. One of the gunmen allegedly posted a manifesto online. How to clean up the internet. Can it be done? We talked to Ellen Pao, the former CEO of Reddit. And chaos in Hong Kong. Anti-government protesters Monday disrupt more than 200 flights, occupy malls and block shopping. The city's chief executive, Carrie Lim Lam, calls the city unsafe and unstable. What's next for demonstrations as well as the markets we will discuss. But first, our top story, U.S. stocks plunging the most in 2019 after China escalated the trade war with the United States, sending stocks down, U.S. stocks down to their biggest drop so far this year and sparking a rally in global bonds. The S&P and Dow both down a little under 3% in Monday trading. The Nasdaq down nearly 3.5%. The tech sector hit particularly hard, leading the way in losses. Just look at some of the big names in the red today. NVIDIA, Apple, IBM, Fortinet, all with drops between 4 and 6%. Investors are starting to grasp the potential for a long-lasting conflict between the world's two largest economies and demand for safe haven assets spiked. Gold made a run toward $1,500. Joining us from New York to discuss Bloomberg's cross-asset reporter Luke Kawa. So Luke, where and why did tech feel the most pain? Well, I, I think to a point you were just raising, it's kind of not that investors weren't ready for this to be a long, drawn-out process. It's that, you know, they thought, well, this would be a long, drawn-out process. Things wouldn't get worse, and they, th they wouldn't get worse this quickly and have the situation escalate. So I think that helps explain kind of why we've been able to, to kind of turn on a dime and sell off this much. If you look, there were signs that maybe, you know, 2020 hindsight, that stocks were overextended. And if you take a dive into my terminal here, we can actually tell that U.S. stocks with exposure to China, of course, this is going to be a lot of tech stocks here. This index is 33% tech. Uh, they've gone off 7% in the past three sessions. So this is actually the worst trade war sell-off we've had in U.S. stocks, just for some size and scope. So is there more to come? That's the question. Yeah, million dollar question. I, I think right now what's interesting is that tech vols actually look a little calm. So we all talk about the VIX, the fear gauge for the market at large. The NASDAQ has its own VXN. And as you pointed out, you know, tech stocks, the NASDAQ sold off by more today, but actually the VIX rose by more in points than VXN. So that could be a bit of a quirk in the volatility markets, or that could signal some kind of lingering complacency in tech. And as it does relate to tech, a lot of you know indexes a lot of money is passively kind of managed or will be keyed off on rising volatility it'll use volatility as an input into making asset allocation decisions right now a lot of trend following funds are going to be in the next few days saying hey we've just had this big jump our risk control budget we've completely blown through it we've got to deleverage a bit so as much as you think you know maybe we're set to retrace a bit there's also some kind of systematic selling that could really come to continue to bite us in the sessions to come I have a chart in my Bloomberg as well showing just how down of a down day it was for the S&P, Luke. Meantime, interestingly, Bitcoin has been stale and stable. And in fact, I saw a run up in the last few days. Is there any connection? Well, I, I think there is a connection today between, you know, Bitcoin's gains and the narrative, but it's not the one you might think. I, you know, the idea of Bitcoin is kind of benefiting in terms of haven flows. I think, you know, the very, very unstable relationship with that. If you're going to try and pinpoint between the news of the day and why Bitcoin might be up, I look straight at the yuan. I look straight at the idea that, you know, rich people in China might prefer to, instead of having their money in a currency that is depreciating past a psychological threshold, that they'd much rather have it in this uh, in this digital form that you know might be a lot easier to get out of the country and circumvent capital controls i think that's probably more the story with bitcoin today all right bloomberg's luke kawa busy day for you and i'm sure more to come this week thank you
Let's continue now with the discussion on investor insight into these moves in New York. We've got Michael Purvis, the CEO of Tallbach and Capital. And joining us from Oregon, Paul Meeks, the lead portfolio manager for Wireless Fund. He's warned about overvalued tech stocks leading up to this most recent earnings season, estimating an 8 to 10 percent decline in tech stocks last month. So uh, you saw something, Paul. I is there more to come? Wow, that's the uh, $64,000 question. What I would tell you is, I think it would be foolhardy to uh, buy this dip because we don't know what's gonna come uh, as a follow on the next couple of days. But there's some tech stocks that have now been smashed. And I like to invest in tech with the Buffett philosophy of uh, be greedy when others are fearful. And there are some opportunities that if you can look me in the eye, straight in the eye and say yes, I do not uh, worry what's going to happen to that stock between now and the next couple of weeks or months, but a year from now I do. There are some stocks that I would very aggressively recommend investors get in if they have the proper one to two year perspective. So Michael, given the uncertainty around the trade war, how do you see tech performing relative to the rest of the market? Are there tech specific things going on here that the broader market won't be, uh, you know, won't succumb to, if you will. Well, I, I think, you know, when you when Luke was just discussing the sell off in tech shares and how that's kind of leading the way down here, there's I think you have to uh, dig in a little bit and, and bifurcate it. So there's certain uh, uh, subsectors, uh, semis or, or, or Apple, for, for instance, that are will have fundamental issues, challenges, if if trade tensions continue to escalate. But I think you also have to look at, look, tech, uh, the, the tech sector, the NDX um, uh, index, that has led the way up, right? And so part of this broader de-risking you're seeing across assets, right, you know, the bond bid, the gold bid, and the Swiss franc bid, uh, as you were just discussing, right, well, you know, what went up the most, what gained a lot, the, uh, gained the most this year is going to be selling off a lot. So I think you have to really uh, disaggregate, you know, what's fundamental and what is de-risking um, uh, there. Fundamental as it relates to this, uh, you know, potential uh, damage from, from escalating trade tensions. So, Paul, let's take a company like Apple, for example. In the short versus the long term, what's the approach? You know, Apple, I've given it a full valuation and then some for the services business that everybody seems to be so enamored with. And I value Apple about $170 to $180 a share. I own it because uh, it's in my benchmark and it is a, uh, a big player. However, going forward, I don't have the same uber bullish view on Apple as others do. I have other ideas, even if you want to play services and software, that I think are superior to Apple. Meantime, it wasn't all bad news. Uh, some tech stocks that ended in the green, Lyft, Roku, Slack, Pinterest. Uh, Michael, where should we be looking for good news? Well, look, I mean, I think when you, uh, you, you know, again, to this concept of bifurcating, what is just being, what is sort of beta being, um, uh, you know, risk managed down and what is, um, you know, what is being fundamentally damaged by escalating trade tensions. You know, there's stocks like Google there, which haven't had a massive valuation, uh, are not at the valuation that we've seen in the past. And, you know, probably arguably don't have quite as much exposure to, um, uh, to some of the trade tensions that some of the other tech stocks do. So there are a lot of pockets there, but I think you really have to look at, when you're thinking about portfolio management, you have to think of, look, if this risk off is going to continue, um, you know, you're going to see uh, the XLK, the Qs uh, sell off, continue to lead the way down. I would point out that, that just on a year-to-date basis, uh, the NDX is still up 300 basis points above the SPX, which, are, you know, two weeks ago when we were, you know, you know, cruising into fresh highs, it was the same three to 400 basis points ahead um, uh, there but again I think I, I, I think your your other guest is is right you, you have there's you, given that we don't know the Chinese reaction function given we don't know the efficacy of incremental monetary stimulus coming out of this I think th there's no reason why you have to jump in and buy this particular dip right now so Paul what are some specific companies that you're watching so there are some companies that I'm pretty bullish on. You know, they've been uh, bludgeoned with uh, either poor June quarter reports or maybe guidance for the quarter that we're in now, but they're good long-term plays. I'm uh, very bullish long-term on the FinTech theme, and I think you'd be very happy with uh, investing a year from now 
in Square and PayPal, and if you want to play it the chicken, you know what way, in the near term. You know, I like uh, MasterCard and Visa. I think well, some of the semiconductor Paul, companies. Paul, hang on a sec. It's interesting that you mentioned Square since shares are down more than 20% over the last couple of days. I spoke to the Square CFO earlier today. You're going to hear that interview a bit later in the show. But Square uh, suffering some pretty big setbacks. I would say yes and no. You know, one of the things I actually was very bullish on coming out of the quarter was the sale of uh, Caviar to DoorDash because now you have a company that is refocused, not just management attention, but it's uh, monetary resources on their core business. I think over time that uh, Square will continue to grow its transactions volume at least 20% maybe with some upside, with some uh, tangential areas that they can get into over time. And I do think Square and PayPal will be uh, great investments. Not in the near term, there might be some downside risk remaining, but over the next year or so. All right, so Michael, let's talk about the near term. What happens the next few days? Look, it, it, again, I think um, you know we are going into some uncharted territories. You're seeing the term premium on 10-year Treasuries make go, go to below minus 100 basis points. You're seeing the Bund at minus 50 basis points. Um, there, I think you have to be prepared to 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 be uh, to, for one more of these volatile August. You know, you can't. Um, it, it doesn't mean you have to rush in and say buy utilities, for example. But I think you have to be very thoughtful about picking your spots and and and, and where to be. I still, uh, you know, on the diversification and how do you play this. Um, uh, destabilizing global condition. Um, you know, gold miners, uh, for example, I, I, I still think have a, a, a long way to run, um, you know, given how consistently um, strong the gold bid has been over the last several months. Um, so that would be w one area to consider. Um, All right. Michael Purvis, we'll have to leave it there. Tallbach and Capital and Paul Meeks of the Wireless Fund. Uh, lots to continue to monitor. Thank you both. Coming up, we're going to talk about semis. Semiconductors plummet after U.S. stocks have their worst day of the year. We take a closer look at how the chip makers are getting hit by U.S.-China trade tensions. This is Bloomberg. As we mentioned earlier, financial markets buckled after China escalated the trade war with the United States, sending U.S. stocks to the biggest drop so far this year. Semiconductor stocks felt the heat and tumbled, extending a recent decline. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, or SOX, down for its fifth straight day, its longest losing streak since October. Joining us to discuss Cypress Semiconductor founder T.J. Rogers in Palo Alto and with us from Washington, Bloomberg Sean Donnan, who covers trade. So, Sean, China now saying they're putting a stop on buying U.S. ag products. How does this end? Yeah, and importantly, allowing the currency to depreciate through that symbolic seven level to the dollar. Uh, I think the, the question of how this ends is the one that's on all of our minds and what's perplexing everyone, including me and, and those of us who cover the trade wars day to day, is is uh, we don't see an, an, an obvious way to end this. Uh, the path looks like one of, of escalation. If we think about what the next move from the Trump administration could be, it's unlikely to be a retreat uh, in that promise or threat of tariffs on a further $300 billion that prompted this Chinese move uh, today. So, uh, TJ, uh, uh, what are the specific trends you're, you're watching with regard to semiconductors? Obviously, uh, Chinese companies buy chips from U.S. companies, U.S. companies buy uh, products from Chinese companies, and it's impacting the entire sector and has been now for months. Yeah, uh, China, you know, most... If you want to look at electronics, the chips are made all over the world. The U.S. is one of the top ones. They all go to China to get it assembled in the product and then go wherever they go after that. And when we start uh, having trade wars and blocking shipments, uh, many U.S. Uh, semiconductors, US semiconductor sh shipments are going down. Having said that, uh, our products are essential to most of the really high-tech stuff. The Chinese do not have a viable high-tech chip industry. They've been working on it for a long time, haven't achieved it, and uh, this is going to hurt them. Uh, it's going to hurt us, but uh, it, not, getting, not getting chips is a big deal if, if you're in an electronics-oriented economy. Um, looking at the Bloomberg, here's a chart of how the SOX has performed over the last year, and you can see that big drop. 
over the last few days. Now, Sean, all of this happening before talks even restart. I mean, they're scheduled to start again in September. Is there a chance of the talks getting back on track? Uh, I think it's hard to say uh, that they are going to get back on track at this point. Uh, I don't think we're going to see either side cancel those talks. I think what we'll see is uh, a meeting uh, that will take place probably here in Washington in early September. Uh, but that meeting is likely to look a lot like the one we had in Shanghai between the two sides last week. Uh, that meeting yielded nothing new, no major progress uh, in the talks. That said, you know, September is still a ways away. Uh, there market signal sent today was was pretty uh, uh, abrupt and certainly noticed in the White House. Uh, if we get a few more of these days, things may change. Uh, TJ, where are the good news stories in chips? Are there some? Well, um, right now, right now it's fairly dismal. Um, but if, if you look at the longer haul, Moore's Law has changed the world. You know, it's gone from a market of nothing uh, to $400 billion and has made everything that we use and touch more valuable. So, you know, we're not in a catastrophic decline. Certainly is not a 2001 or even a 2008 kind of decline. So, you know, if, if you like semiconductors, uh, you, now's the time to go pick the companies you like and get on board. All right, Sean. Let's talk about what this means for businesses going forward. And remember, this happened after the president uh, sent a tweet escalating tariffs after others in the administration had said the talks had been productive. So continuing mis mixed messages. But now, uh, you know, China responding and tough to imagine going back. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the reality that a lot of businesses need to get used to, at least for the foreseeable future, is that these tariffs and more to come uh, September 1st are, are the new reality, uh, especially in this uh, huge economic relationship. And that is already leading a lot of businesses uh, in the tech sector and others to rethink their supply chains that go through China, uh, think about moving them out of China, think about uh, segmenting them into a, a, a supply chain that goes, that services the China market and one that services the U.S. market. Uh, so there's a big shakeup there to be had for businesses. But these costs are real. Uh, these costs look like they're here to stay for a good long while. All right. Bloomberg Sean Donnan in Washington. Also Cypress Semiconductor founder T.J. Rogers. Uh, we'll keep watching. Thank you both. Coming up, Square continues to plunge amid concerns over the company's sale of its food delivery app, Caviar. Square's CFO will join us to explain why they unloaded it next. This is Bloomberg. Square shares keep on sliding. Shares of the fintech company extending losses Monday, falling as much as 20 percent over two days after the company issued weaker than expected third quarter guidance. This while beating analyst estimates on both second quarter earnings and revenue. Square also facing questions over its decision to sell its food delivery app Caviar to DoorDash for $410 million. I sat down with Square CFO Amrita Ahuja to discuss the slump and asked her how much of it was due to trade tension. Take a listen. Clearly, uh, certainly today, it seems like in Friday, there was a broader um, sort of narrative around uncertainty related to macro and, and trade, for sure. How does what's happening in China impact your business? You know, today we have a small hardware business. It's about 5% of our revenues and also a small portion of our costs where we do business in China. We manufacture some of our hardware goods in China and bring them to the U.S. and other markets. Um, as I said, it's a small percentage of our revenues, small percentage of our costs. Uh, we have levers around both pricing and supply chain to pull levers if we need to in the event to respond to various macro concerns. Given that you manufacture some hardware in China, would you consider moving it out of the country in the current climate? Um, all of those options are on the table right now. But again, we're focused on, on our customers, and hardware is a great way for us to onboard, but it's still a very small percentage of our revenue. So let's talk about the sale of Caviar to yeah. DoorDash, which was a surprise to investors. And I think some investors were hoping you would sell it for more. What didn't you accomplish with Caviar that you were hoping to? And what do you hope to accomplish now that it's unloaded? 
You know, the transaction with Caviar was actually not about the business performance for Caviar. It was about seeing the really strong growth and the ability to influence our two strong and growing ecosystems with our seller ecosystem and our cash app ecosystem. So it was really about creating greater clarity, focus, and investment potential for those two existing ecosystems that we've built over the last five to 10 years at Square. One analyst, Jeff Cantwell from Guggenheim said, while probably a smart long-term business decision, it leaves us questioning the uniqueness of Square's business model versus other payments competitors, which have rapidly improved their platforms and go-to-market approaches. How do you respond to that? What we have now is the opportunity to participate in the economics of the delivery and logistics ecosystem as a partner and as a platform provider. So just this past quarter, we actually announced two partnerships with DoorDash, one related to a service that we have called Order Manager, which enables our sellers to link up to DoorDash, Caviar, Postmates, and other delivery platforms, and we get to participate in the economics as a platform. And then secondly, we announced a partnership with DoorDash around a strategic partnership for Cash Boost, which provides instant rewards for our customers who use uh, the cash debit card. So that's just the beginning. We see more strategic opportunities to partner and participate in the ecosystem in that way. Uh, cryptocurrency has been in the headlines lately. Obviously, Facebook uh, shook up Washington, D.C. with their Libra plans. You've got lawmakers who are infuriated and a lot of skepticism. Square has experimented with cryptocurrency in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you see this or could cryptocurrency become a bigger part of your business? You know, what we believe is that we want to make small experiments in the near term that enable us to learn and invent for longer term opportunities. Mm -hmm. So what we did with Cash App was launch a Bitcoin investing product, which where we saw opportunities for customers to provide easy access to buying and selling Bitcoin, that drove $125 million in revenues at the top line in this last quarter. But what it really did for us was drive engagement. When people had the opportunity to continually come back into the Cash App to check to see how their Bitcoin was doing, to use it as a store of funds, that provided a daily utility with Cash App. So that was an example of an experiment that we made that helped us learn about cryptocurrency and the exchange of it, but also helped us drive engagement and see how people engage with Cash App on a daily basis. So how bullish are you on cryptocurrency in general? We are really excited to see what it, what the future has in store, and it's a, it's an important area for us to continue to experiment. Square CFO Amrita Ahuja there. Coming up, another mass shooting and another white nationalist manifesto finds its way to the darkest corners of the internet. We'll look at what can be done to fight online extremists. Next, this is Bloomberg. Technology, I'm Emily Chang. A pair of mass shootings in the United States that killed over 30 people once again has the nation debating social media's role in senseless acts of violence. This is the third time this year that an alleged mass gunman has posted a so-called murderer's manifesto on the messaging platform 8chan before their attacks. This shooter gunned down at least 22 people in El Paso, Texas. Authority believe the suspect posted his white nationalist racist screed less than 20 minutes before the first emergency calls came in. The same thing happened with the mosque shootings in Christchurch, New Zealand, where 51 people were killed, and in the California synagogue in April that killed one and injured three. Now the founder of 8chan is saying enough is enough. He told the New York Times, quote, shut the site down. It's not doing the world any good. It is a complete negative to everybody except the users that are there. And you know what? It's a negative to them, too. They just don't realize it. President Trump weighed in on Monday, blaming mental illness, the press, video games, and social media for the shooting. To discuss, I want to bring in someone intimately familiar with trying to clean up the darkest corners of the internet. Ellen Powell is the CEO of Project Include, and before that, she was interim CEO at Reddit, where she made it her mission to try to clean up the site. So, Ellen, how much do you think social media is to blame for these kinds of acts of violence? I think there are so many different things that are to blame, and social media is definitely a big part of it. I think um, 
the founders were very naive and, or maybe just lazy in allowing it to be, allowing the platforms to be this free for all. And now we're reaping the, the results of it, which is, you know, people are yelling at each other, they're harassing each other, and now they've taken it into real life where they're actually shooting people down. Now, when you cracked down on speech at Reddit, which was not easy, there were a lot of people who disagreed with what you were doing. Actually, research in the aftermath shows that you did, uh, what, what, what you did increased positive conversation. And there were some users who started behaving as a result. And yet there were other users who simply fled to other sites like Vote, 4chan, 8chan. Talk to us about the challenges of doing something in addition to doing nothing. It's it's hard. I think a lot of people want to see this magic bullet where it's, you know, if I'm the CEO of Reddit, I should take all the content down and that will solve the problem. But it doesn't because there are other places. But I also think that that's, it's important to do something where I don't have to solve the whole problem as CEO of my platform, but I should make my platform a place where people can actually have conversations where real information is outweighing the fake information and where people are becoming more knowledgeable and better at interacting with each other and they're not being led down this path towards white supremacy, towards misogyny, towards transphobia, towards um, terrorism. Let's take a listen to what the president had to say about this today. He talked about online radicalization. Take a listen. We must recognize that the Internet has provided a dangerous avenue to radicalize, disturb minds, and perform demented acts. We must shine light on the dark recesses of the Internet and stop mass murders before they start. Saying they're calling on the federal government to put pressure on social media companies to try to find mass shooters before they they engage in these acts. Is that realistic? I, I think it's hypocritical. I think he, of all people, should just stop radicalizing people. He should stop the um, racist, white, nationalistic, or supremacist, actually, um, talk that he does uh, using the internet to spread those messages and, um, and enable those terrorists. So let's talk about that. You know, how much do you think this is a Trump-related thing where you know, he retweets, retweets right-wing wing extremists, he doesn't call for gun restrictions and instead blames social media. And how much is this really social media's fault for letting things get out of control? It's a mix. It's always complicated. I mean, obviously, he has a huge role in spreading these messages and in normalizing them. But the media has this huge role, both social media, for amplifying and for allowing him to continue to violate the rules on their um, platforms. And then also journalists are amplifying his messages, are you know looking for those clicks, looking for that attention, and pushing out stories that really amplify some of his messages of hate. Um, the former U.S. Homeland Security Secretary, Michael Chertoff, uh, had this to say about what he sees happening online as well. Take a listen. Particularly because of certain elements in the Internet, uh, a kind of intensification of the kind of behavior that we've seen in these tragic occurrences over the last couple of weeks. It's not that people have necessarily changed, but that they've been, been able, through the network, to find each other and in some instances to encourage or incite people to go out and actually act on some of these crazy impulses. So what more can social media companies do? Oh, I think they can, yeah, I think they can set up rules, and many of them have them already, but actually apply them, apply them across everybody. And let's stop giving an exception to people who generate more clicks or more engagement than other people. Let's stop giving an ex exemption for um, the president. Let's stop giving an exemption for people who we think are going to complain the most uh, for being, uh, for being uh, taken off the platforms. In the past, when you've come on this show, you've said that Twitter should ban President Trump from the site. Do you still yeah. believe that? Yeah, we look at what's going on, and I think that it would be very hard to say that he didn't impact these terrorist acts. That It wasn't partly because of him inciting groups to um, target uh, people from different places, people from um, different backgrounds, people who, with different skin colors. I think it's a very um, 
convenient thing to blame the internet, but that doesn't solve the problem, right? We have to really get down to what is it that we need to do? And it's like, let's have these clear role, rules. You're not allowed to in, get, uh, you're not allowed to harass people. You're not allowed to, you know, threaten people. You're not allowed to incentivize, incentivize people towards violence or to, um, have people start um, aggregating. You're not allowed to do that across different platforms. And these are not rules that are new. These are rules that have been out there. These are the rules at Reddit since um, since uh, I put them in there. And let's just apply them evenly. Like, enough with the quarantining. Like, when you have different rules for different groups of people, it doesn't make sense. Hmm. Like, stick to the rules so people understand. It, you know, you do that with your child. When you set boundaries, you make very clear rules. And when you start making exceptions, it becomes confusing. And that's when you get a lot of bad activity. Now, 8chan is the site that is in question today, and we heard from the founder of 8chan calling for the site to be shut down, which is interesting. You know, even six years ago, he he suggested that some of these mass shootings were linked to 8chan, and here we are six years later, and, and nothing has changed. Um, there are also businesses that provide services to some of these websites, yeah. like Cloudflare, um, which was keeping essentially 8chan's site up and protecting it from denial of service attacks and repeatedly refused to to pull it down but cloudflare has even now uh, decided to stop servicing 8chan um, we've got a statement from the ceo matthew prince who said they've proven themselves to be lawless and that lawlessness has caused multiple tragic deaths uh, even if 8chan may have not may not have violated the letter of the law and refusing to moderate their hateful community, they have created an environment that revels in violating its spirit. Now, you pointed out before you came on the show that there are other, like Twitter, for example, has a verified 8chan account. What are some, what are some things that other companies can do um, to be stricter even when it comes to the websites themselves, let alone the people yeah. who are on them. I think a big part of it is thinking about like what are the real life implications of the things that are going on in your site. So maybe the words aren't exactly um, doing something terrible just alone on your site, but you look at what's happening in real life, you look at what's happening on other platforms, and all of this work coalesces in really terrible, hateful behavior. So how do you think about that in the context of your contributions to it? How do you think about not necessarily solving the whole problem? Right. So what if they go to other platforms? So what if they are still going to aggregate, but you've done your best mm -hmm. to solve the problem with the tools that you have? I think you know, saying that it's too hard or saying that it's not going to solve the whole problem, saying that you, know, you need to be able to track these people, like, it's not worked. Right. We've gone through the past two decades and seen that the Internet actually is not a place where humans come to have positive conversations. They come to um, have, uh, you know, to, to get a dopamine rush. They come to really engage in emotional behavior, and it's less thoughtful than we imagined. So do your part, no matter how big or small yeah. you are. Okay. Alan Powell, CEO of Project Include, former CEO of Reddit, thank you so much. Always appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you for having me. All right, meantime, Bill Ackman's Pershing Square Capital Management has liquidated its positions in United Technologies and ADP. Ackman has reportedly decided to sell his stake in United Technologies rather than fight its takeover of Raytheon. Billionaire investor had previously vowed to oppose the deal, saying it lacked strategic sense. In a letter to investors, Ackman said he has exited ADP because much of the low-hanging fruit has been picked. He said it was a successful investment and returned about 50% for Pershing Square's co-investors. Coming up, Google veteran Laszlo Bach is credited with creating the field of people analytics. Now he's bringing AI and machine learning to HR outside of Google. We'll talk about his startup, Humu, next. This is Bloomberg. Over the course of a decade, Laszlo Bach helped Google grow from 6 to 72,000 employees, 6,000 to 72,000. During that time, Google was recognized as a top employer over 150 times, racking up titles like best company to work for in the United States, though, of course, the company has received more scrutiny recently. Now, Bach is bringing his Google learnings to other companies with his startup, Hulu. 
Humu, Humu uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to nudge managers and employees toward behavioral changes, all with the goal of creating a happier workplace. Joining us now to discuss for our Work Shifted series, Humu CEO and co-founder, Laszlo Bach. Laz, good to have you here. Thanks, great to be here. On the show. There. So you ran people operations at Google for a decade. Yeah. And so what was missing from that experience that you are now bringing the business world with Humu? Uh, the biggest thing was that I realized that on a really, really bad day at Google, at least while I was there, your biggest problem was maybe the lobster bisque was cold, right? Like it was, it was a pretty privileged place to work. And for people who, like me, were immigrants or people who worked hourly jobs or people who worked in like cafes or retail, work was not going to get much better sooner. And so we started Tuma with the idea of bringing some of that goodness to other organizations. So you're using AI to identify behavioral changes, to give employees nudges to help them be better versions of themselves. What exactly does that mean in practice? Well, what it means is if you step back, it's hard for organizations to change and it's hard for managers to be good managers and it's hard for employees to be good team members, to feel safe, to feel secure. And our idea, which so far has been working pretty well, is that if you better understand what's going on with the, with the people in an organization, at the team level, at an individual level, they want to be better, they want to learn and grow. So small interventions, small reminders that we call nudges to a manager, to a team member, to a colleague, actually can drive more behavioral change for the good than all the training in the world. Hmm. So give me some examples of so, this at work. So one example is there's a, uh, there's a restaurant chain we work with and uh, they, they wanted to roll out a new product, right? They wanted soup in their stores and it was new. But the underlying problem we identified in some of their stores was not product development or product launches, it was that people didn't feel free to ask their managers questions. Mm. And the workforce, it's largely hourly, mostly high school educated, very diverse, largely workforce from underrepresented groups. Mm. So the nudges we sent were simple. We told managers to just ask people for advice and their opinions, and we nudged individuals to assume good intent. Because often as an employee, you assume your manager is out to get you. So the combination of those things caused people to say, like, look, why don't we, I don't know, why don't we give out free samples? Why don't we let people try the product? And that in turn led to more sales, more business. That was great, but more important, was more trust with their managers and the team members and people felt better about the work. It's interesting that you mentioned contractors and you can't do an interview without talking about your work at Google and Google, one of the issues Google has been facing is criticism over how they handle TVCs, temps, vendors, mm -hmm. contractors. You've got senators just today mm -hmm. sending a letter to, to Google CEO Sundar Pichai calling on, on him to make these employees full time. They make up like half of Google's workforce. Mm -hmm. Is there a better approach for Google? when it comes uh, to contractors? Yeah, I mean, I think in general you should hire them as employees. Um, you think Sundar Pichai should hi hire all these temps as employees? Well, I think in general you should. So for example, mm -hmm. at Humu, we have somebody who's working part-time. Um, they're a recruiter for us, and I reached out to her and said, I'd much rather have you as an employee on the books, with benefits, with stock, with all kinds of goodness. And I can see situations where you sort of try before you buy. You don't know if the person's going to work out. There's some jobs that are like that, right? Also, if you're ramping up and ramping down rapidly, you don't know as a business if you're going to invest for the long term. Um, but no, I generally think if you're going to employ people, you should employ them. What if they say, it's too expensive? If the company say that? Yeah. Um, I think that's just cost of doing business. Hmm. All right. What about, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of this that there were times when the biggest problem at Google was the lobster bisque being cold. You know, now you have employees protesting the way the company has handled sexual misconduct, 20,000 employees walking out of the com company. How could Google have handled that better? Uh, well, it's hard to say, because on the ground, things al always look different. So I don't want to second guess the folks no. who are there. Um, I will say one of the nice things about being at Humu with mm -hmm. a great team of co-founders is um, we get to make our own policies and we make decisions. And we've got a very clear policy. If you engage in any kind of behavior of that kind, the kind that was alleged, you're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so far that's served us pretty well. Uh, meantime, there's a, a, an employee, a G former Google employee who was on maternity leave who says she's not going back. She's written this memo, went viral via motherboard, um, says e despite these clear policies that Google mm -hmm. says they had, um, she had problems with her manager, this person retaliated, and now it's not a safe place for her to work. Google saying they prohibit retaliation in their workplace, it's, 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 it's very clear. Mm -hmm. Policy, there's multiple channels to report concerns. What about when the policies don't seem to work? Well, that's one of the things that's really tough about management. So again, 
I haven't been at Google for a while. I was mm -hmm. excited when we came up with the idea of five months of full paid maternity leave. That was mm. groundbreaking for the U.S. at the time. Yes. Canada, not such a big deal. They had better. Uh, at Huma, we offer a year of parental mm -hmm. leave um, mm -hmm. and because we think that's important. It's a special time in someone's life, and you should care for that child, and you shouldn't have financial pressure to come Are back Are people to work. taking the year? Yeah. Uh, we've had two moms go out. One's out now. One just came back from work. Uh, Jen Brown and Annie Wickman, and they're amazing. Mm -hmm. Actually, not the year. Sorry, the mm -hmm. first one took six months. We'll mm -hmm. see about Annie. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you know some of the things that you're doing, not, where, where you have full control, you're doing things differently. Why? Uh, well, I think I think one of the things about leadership. This, this is one of the things you know I, I did learn at my last job. If you're lucky enough to have a large brand behind you and have some reputation, that carries with it some responsibility. It's, it's like Spider-Man's uncle, right? <laughs> you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And there's certain issues where you should speak out. But it's also true that inside a company, if you're not the founder, CEO, you often have limited ability to do that. And it's just a luxury and a blessing to be able to say, like, look, the right thing is you provide a year of parental leave. The right thing is if somebody engages in bad conduct, you let them go. It doesn't matter if they're valuable to the business or not. There's behaviors that aren't acceptable. So quickly, how do you think Humu can make a company like Google or any company better? Well, what we've seen in companies like, and, and there's only a few companies where we can share the names publicly, but places like Fidelity, mm -hmm. um, uh, places like Sweetgreen, places, mm -hmm. uh, you know, firms like that, places like Virgin Atlantic, is that the cumulative effect of small interventions helps people be their best selves. Mm. And so you see improvements in things like openness, in terms of sharing, in terms of uh, gratitude, in terms of just how people treat one another as human beings, which, by the way, ends up having a business impact. You see, you know, 2 to 12% productivity lift, all kinds of business benefit. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing for me is people come to work happier, mm -hmm. and they leave work happier. Mm -hmm. Just treat people like human beings, which we can all do, starting now. Doesn't seem that hard. <laughs> Lazo Bach, CEO of Humu, thank you so much. It's good to hear about the progress. Thank you. Great to be here. All right, still ahead, unrest in Hong Kong. Protesters hit the streets for the ninth straight weekend. More details from the city next. This is Bloomberg. Activism continuing on the streets of Hong Kong. It is the ninth straight weekend of unrest. Protesters have tried to shut down the city, disrupting daily commutes. This as U.S.-China trade tensions heat up and U.S. markets come plummeting down. Joining us from Hong Kong to give a better picture, Bloomberg Sophie Kamerudin. So Sophie, set the scene for us. What is happening right now? Emily, I'm here in the Hong Kong district of Admiralty, where the government headquarters, the Legislative Council building, is located. Now, this area was shrouded in white smoke on Monday after police used tear gas to dispel protesters here. Now, similar tactics were used in other sites across the city as demonstrators gathered around seven rallying points throughout Hong Kong Island, the New Territories, and Kowloon, bringing the city to a standstill as they proceeded with a general strike even after Chief Executive Carrie Lam warned that they were bringing the city to a very dangerous situation. Now, she also did not make concessions to the protesters' demands, which include calls for her resignation and the complete withdrawal of that controversial extradition bill. Now, the government also condemned demonstrators for attacking at least two police stations. Now, some other color from the happenings here on Monday. We had 170 flights canceled, subway services were sus suspended, and some roads were blocked, adding then to the uncertainty for businesses as well as for investors, Emily. Uh, Sophie, we're looking at some pretty disturbing scenes here. Is there a, a, a count of, of injuries and, and how some of these people are doing? Well, when it comes to the count, uh, these are some of the stats that I can offer you. In a police briefing yesterday, the first of many uh, daily briefings that are to take place from here on out, they noted that 1,000 rounds of tear gas are fired, 150 rounds of rubber bullets, uh, sponge bullets, and 420 people have been detained, including 82 on Monday. Now, since the clashes first began on June 9th, we have seen um, some injuries. We have seen protesters and police 
case um, being hospitalized, adding then uh, to some of the concerns for uh, local residents as to where to uh, from here, especially since they're not really uh, receiving very well uh, the remarks from the government and the chief executive, Carrie Lam, confidence in her administration has just crumbled. And, and Sophie, while I have you with us, the U.S. Treasury Department has just designated China as a currency manipulator. Of course, that term has been a longtime issue between the United States and China, and we have seen the ratcheting up of trade tensions on both sides. What's your take on uh, the U.S. here again upping the ante? So with this uh, labeling or this, uh, this threat of labeling uh, China a currency manipulator, that comes after uh, the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, and Beijing officials allowed for the yuan ostensibly to break through that psychologically uh, key level of 7 yuan against the dollar. This is China doesn't seem to be wanting to give ground uh, to the U.S. after those threats of tariffs, which are to uh, take effect on September 1st. So the read here is that you have this game of chicken really unfolding. Uh, China also uh, uh, requesting for big agricultural companies on the mainland to stop um, their purchases from U.S. agri uh, companies. So uh, this is going to be going on for some time. Uh, you know, not much leeway here when it comes uh, to compromise, perhaps. But again, uh, fresh uh, uh, rounds of talks, uh, they're anticipated uh, next month. Emily. All right. Bloomberg Sophie Kamerudin in Hong Kong. Stay safe and keep us posted. Uh, keep watching Bloomberg Television for updates on what's happening in Hong Kong throughout the evening. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter. Find us there at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network, TikTok, on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.